The other night, I decided that I wanted to watch one of my favorite movies. It's one that we also own, called Lars and the Real Girl. It's not overtly a movie with Lenten themes, but the more period I watched it, the more I realized how appropriate it is, and especially in relationship to this week's gospel text. It starts in church, with the pastor preaching about the great commandment, specifically the part that tells us to love one another. And he emphasizes that love is God in action. It then becomes apparent over the next couple of scenes that Lars, a young man in his 20s, has some real mental health issues. He has difficulty connecting with people, seems to be almost excruciatingly shy, and finds any touch to be unbearable. He lives in his brother and sister-in-law's garage and prefers the isolation. Then the young man with whom he shares a cubicle at work shows him a website that has full-sized, adult weight, anatomically correct dolls. And Lars, in his innocence and unbeknownst to anyone else, orders one. When she arrives, he names her Bianca and creates a whole history, personality, and previous relationship with her. He says she speaks little English and uses a wheelchair because she can't walk. He believes it would be inappropriate for her to stay with him in the garage and asks that she might stay in the spare bedroom of his brother's house. When the town psychologist recommends that Lars' brother and sister-in-law humor him and go along with the idea until he decides that he doesn't need Bianca anymore, they meet with a few of their church friends and share about the situation, asking for their help so that Lars might recover from his delusion. An older man in the group responds with revulsion we don't want anything to do with her. She's a golden calf. We all know what happened with that, he says. Another friend says, he's not worshiping her. One inquires, they're just dating? And the older man speaks again. These young people have no willpower. <laughs> Lars' brother says pleadingly, he's sick, all right? He's sick. And the sister-in-law adds, we were just hoping if we came to you, you could help pave the way a little. If you could just try to understand. And then Mrs. Bruner, probably 70 years old or so, says, oh, for heaven's sake, what's the big deal? Sally, your cousin puts dresses on his cats. Hazel, your nephew gave all his money to a UFO club. Arnie indicating the older man. Everyone knows your first wife was a klepto. <laughs> she was not, he protests. And she responds, then why is she buried in a pair of my earrings? <laughs> and she concludes, these things happen. Lars is a good boy. You can depend on me. And Lars's journey of transformation, facilitated by a loving community, begins. Now we all get accustomed to our lives, and sometimes things happen that require some mental and social adjustment. That's what happens in our gospel text for today. Jesus and the disciples are walking, and they encounter a man who was born blind. Jesus' disciples ask, almost idly it seems, objectifying the man, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Can't you just see it them pointing? A question like this seeks information only. The man isn't real to them or someone for whom to feel sympathy. They don't expect anything to change. And the implication is that God caused his blindness, punishing someone for their particular sins. And Jesus responds, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. But revealed to whom? And for what purpose? Jesus spits on the ground, makes mud, spreads it on the man's eyes, and tells him to go wash in the pool whose name means sent. 
after he does so and gets his sight, the questions and blaming begin. The man's sight has, in a sense, become an inconvenient truth. How do those around him make sense of it? First, there's the attempt of the neighbors to say, this must not be the man born blind. It's just someone like him. After all, his eyes are open, and he looks completely different. Must be a different man altogether. But he continues to protest that he is the one, and he describes how Jesus healed him. But he doesn't know where Jesus is. His surroundings are different with his new vision. Then these same neighbors take him to the Pharisees to help them make sense of it. But the Pharisees become divided in their opinion. Their first consideration is that this healing was done on the Sabbath. For some, that is reason enough to discount it. The healer could not get his power from God if he healed on the Sabbath, they think. But others are not so sure. How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs, they say? The Jewish authorities then conduct an investigation. His parents are called. Is this your son? Was he born blind? How can it be that he sees? And his parents, maybe sensing that there's a search for a scapegoat here, say only the minimal amount to answer their questions. Yes, this is our son. Yes, he was born blind. But we don't know how it happened or who caused him to see. Ask him. When they ask the man directly, he is weary. I told you already. Why do you want me to tell you again? Do you also want to become his disciples? And they say that they're Moses' disciples, but they don't know where this man gets his power. So they decide that they can't decide. The man can't believe it. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing, he says. And they drive him out of the temple because they still see him as a man born in sin and will not learn anything from him. The man's story doesn't end there because he comes to believe that Jesus is Lord. But Jesus' final remark illuminates the big reversal. He came into the world so that those who do not see may see. And those who do see, they become blind. Throughout this story, it becomes obvious that the healing of the man born blind makes people uncomfortable. They don't know what to do with it. The disciples want to look at him like a bug under a microscope. Who sinned? What a shame, but it must be God's will. Then after the healing, the first people want to say, it must be someone else. That magnitude of change can't happen. Then in looking for answers, the parents are grilled. Is this your son? Was he born blind? How can he see? The attempts to dismiss the event continue. The healer must be a, a sinner healing on the Sabbath. If he's a sinner, we can discount this healing. We don't have to pay attention to this thing that makes us so uncomfortable. Or being a disciple of Moses and of this man, must be incompatible. We don't know him. And finally, we're full circle. The man must have been born blind, must have been born blind because of sin. So how can he teach the Jewish authorities? And they throw him out. It's a nice, neat, closed little circle that doesn't admit the astonishing, the miraculous, but can't be explained. And we understand it very well, because we know our own tendency to do the same. But we also know what happens when Jesus comes to us. Love and transformation and healing, if not always a cure. As Dr. David Lowe says about this passage, when Jesus comes, he changes things. And those changes can be hard. But goodness, they are also life-giving for what Jesus wants for us. is isn't just survival, persistence, getting by, or any of the other ways we formulate and excuse living half-lives. 
No. What Jesus wants for us is life, full, rich, and abundant. The kind of life that stems from knowing that we have infinite worth in God's eyes and are and always will be God's beloved child. Jesus loves us enough to see us where we truly are, enough to not leave us there, enough to transform us as individuals or as a community, like the community that helps Lars to find himself, his courage, and his love, and finds itself transformed in the process. I invite you to live with this text over the next week. And then to come imagine together with Ken and Britt in our second mutual ministry review how Jesus, the light of the world, is in the process of transforming St. Francis. Our lives together and separately, our discipleship, our mission and ministry.